You may have seen my recent video about TVR and TWR and I talk a little bit about the Jaguar XJ220 which was a joint development between Jaguar and TWR. I was so taken with Jaguar's supercar I thought I'd make a whole video about it and I managed to score an interview with Nick Hull who was one of the original designers and Nick's managed to share some information that I don't think too many people know about about the car. Now I generally don't do promotions. But Nick has two fascinating books you might be interested in. The first is The History of Ford Design and Production in the UK from 1908 when Ford first started in the UK to the 2010s. The second is A History of Land Rover's Design, again from when they first started making Land Rovers in the 1940s. Each book has amazing detail from interviews with people involved and some great photos from the archives. There's links to both in the description. So why did the XJ220, a car named because it was expected to go 220 miles an hour, only manage 212 miles an hour? Why did the boss of TWR go white when he first heard of it? And why did it both win and not win the 24 Hours of Le Mans? This is the Jaguar XJ220 story. In 1985, Austin Rover launched the MG EXE, a supercar to rejuvenate the beaten down British car maker. That car never made it to production, there not being enough cash to spare, but it generated a lot of excitement. Supercars, after all, were an Italian thing, so the idea of a new British supercar was quite enticing. Jaguar had been a part of the nationalised British Leyland enterprise that became Austin Rover, but in 1984 had been spun off to once more become a private business listed on the London Stock Exchange. Jaguar was already working with motorsports team TWR and that was generating wins, but Jaguar felt that they could design something themselves to win Le Mans in-house, just as the C and D type had done back in the 1950s and maybe they could sell a few road cars along the way. Jaguar designer Nick Hull got wind of the project and jumped at the chance to contribute. The kind of brief for it was it, it was um, it was fairly clear what it was. It was um, at that time Group B was was particularly dominating or, or influencing rallying um, things like the Ford RS200, the Lancia, the Peugeot 205 rally cars, those were done under Group B rules. And the Group B for road going cars was kind of less defined. The Porsche 959 had come out, the F40, we didn't know about the F40, and there had been the Ferrari 288 GTO launched around that time. And so, yeah, it seemed an obvious thing to do to do a, you know, a flagship car. Mark Lloyd, a qualified aerodynamicist, would work on the shape. The brief was to avoid aerodynamic aids and go for a clean look that wouldn't look out of place next to Jaguar's current range. Influences were the Buick Wildcat and Chevrolet Corvette Indy concepts, but progress was slow. This wasn't an officially sanctioned project, there just wasn't money available. There wasn't a full-size car there, there was never a full-size clay done because there wasn't the budget for it. There was no budget for this at all. It was all just currying favours from suppliers and so on. So there was a, you know, there were scale models that were done. And um, the other reason was that every few days in the styling studio, we would have other people coming in from sales and marketing and product planning and so on, who, um, you know, were not to know about the project. So, you know, even within a company, there are, there are things that not everybody knows about. So we just throw the covers over the models there and, and hide them in a corner. The team worked on it in their spare time, evenings and weekends, and became known as the Saturday Club. They even booked time to other projects, anything to make progress on their passion project. They still had to do their regular day jobs, of course, updating the XJ and XJS to keep them relevant and pay the bills. To win on the track, this new supercar would use Jaguar's V12 engine. With recent motorsports tuning giving it 48 valves, the team felt it could reach 220 miles an hour. That was a ridiculous speed for a road going car, but it was needed if this car, tentatively named the XJ220, could win at Le Mans. 
the XJ220 name, referenced the 120 mile an hour XK120 Roadster, Jaguar's first post-war sports car. Soon after Jaguar started work on the XJ220, Porsche launched the 959. The road-going Le Mans winner became a rabbit to chase, literally, with a 197 mile an hour top speed. Group B regulations steered the team towards a mid-engined all-wheel drive car with a chassis made from weight-saving aluminium. By calling in favours and using a spare engine from the motorsports program, a test chassis was built with very little cost to Jaguar. All-wheel drive was considered necessary in the 1980s when cars like the Audi Quattro were dominating, and it came from the people behind the four-wheel drive Jensen FF from the 1960s. Four-wheel steering was trending on cars at this time, where the rear wheels turned slightly to reduce the turning circle, and the test car was fitted with Jaguar's implementation, along with ABS and height adjustable suspension. Over time, two mock-ups of the exterior were produced, with one by Keith Helfert chosen as the final design. Although the mantra was to avoid aerodynamic aids, the car featured a rear wing that folded into the bodywork at lower speeds. No one was assigned to design the interior, so Nick stepped up, creating a luxurious leather-trimmed interior with electrically adjustable heated seats. Another standout feature were electrically operated butterfly doors. I guess because it was a concept, they were we did butterfly doors just for the drama, the theatre of it as a concept. And in fact, we didn't really have a, a body engineer support. So when it came to butterfly doors, I, I did all the engineering for that basically. So it was quite tricky to work out the path of the door so that it cleared door seals and, and so on. Um, and the fact that it was taking part of the dashboard up with it, we had to make sure that cleared the A-pillar correctly. So it goes up and actually slightly outwards. Yeah, we, we just kind of engineered it on the hoof, really. Um, we used hinges from a Dame limousine because they were just the biggest, strongest hinges that were to hand. The project had begun in 1985, and by 1988, the team felt they had something that could be produced. It was ready to be shown to the world, but this project had been developed in relative secrecy, so many in Jaguar, even at the top, had no knowledge of it. But it was actually only shown to the Jaguar board um, eight days before the, the Moda show, and it was only at that point that there had to be a decision. Are they going to show this or not? And there was a lot of... Um, you know, top end decisions to be said. If, if they do show this car, what is going to be the official stance of it? Are we going to say we're going to produce it? Um, what if it isn't well received? Would it be an embarrassment if it is well received, but we can't, we haven't got a statement about what we're doing with it? What happens then? That's an embarrassment. There was more competition as well. The Porsche 959 had been joined by the Ferrari F40, a car also intended as a Group B racer. So there was a meeting where the car was shown. We just finished the car off site at another supplier's and the board members came along and saw it for the first time. And us as team members, we were very nervous about that. We weren't invited to the final meeting. We were there uh, around the car. We'd finished it off. Um, this was about midnight as well. The board members came and saw it and went off to another room and huddled together for about half an hour and then came out of the room and said, we've got a decision. And the decision was, we are going to show it at the Motor Show. And then that last eight days was a real rush to get everything finished um, in time. This had been a secretive Jaguar project without any input from motorsports partner TWR. But if that car was to be produced for Group B Racing, TWR was probably going to be involved with racing it, so they needed to be involved in the decision. In any case, all of Jaguar's internal resources for producing cars were tied upon updates to the XJ and XJS, so it was possible TWR could help in producing the XJ220. Tom Walkinshaw, the owner of TWR, or Tom Walkinshaw Racing, was at the meeting, and it gave him quite a shock. And so when he saw the car for the first time that evening, he was absolutely white. His face went white. He was so shocked. Because, of course, he had been developing quietly his own road-going supercar with Peter Stevens, XJR15. And he knew nothing about this. He spent quite a lot of time and investment on this XJR15 as a road-going Le Mans car. Um, suddenly, his plans for that to, to do a ta-da and show that to Jaguar had gone out the window. 
The XJ220 was to be shown at the British Motor Show in Birmingham and final preparations came down to the wire. The car was completed at 3 a.m., shipped down the road to the NEC and unveiled eight hours later. It received an overwhelmingly positive response from the public and press because of course it would, I mean, just look at it. It probably helped also that the Jaguar TWR XJR9 had just won Le Mans three months earlier. Jaguar's official line agreed beforehand was that they hadn't decided whether to put the XJ220 into production, which in truth they hadn't. But the sheer volume of customers putting down £50,000 deposits persuaded them to find a way to put it into production. After the show, Jaguar and TWR decided their recent joint venture, Jaguar Sport, would produce it. The XJ220 concept was always designed to be a limited production car. 200 homologation cars had to be produced for it to go racing at Le Mans. But when the XJ220 team started looking at production, in the cold light of day it was clear that there were some serious issues. Well, only one really. The biggest problem with the, the concept car as a production car was that it was, it was just too heavy. There wasn't a tyre around at the time that could take uh, it weighed about 1850 kilograms. There wasn't a tyre that could take that weight and do 200 miles an hour. It had to lose 450 kilograms, otherwise it, it, you know, there were no tyres that, that could take that weight and that speed. And that's what drove the, the, the need to um, ditch the V12 engine, which is an incredibly heavy engine and four-wheel drive system and go for something which was, um, which was feasible, which could actually you know, achieve over 200 miles an hour. Both the Porsche 959 and Ferrari F40 were lighter, so if the Jaguar XJ220 wanted to win races, it needed to go on a major diet. It was painful to lose the V12 as it meant losing all that power, but TWR had a good replacement. Austin Rover developed a 3-litre V6 to turn its mild-mannered Metro into an absolute beast to compete in rallying. In a twist of fate, it was also the engine pegged to be used in the MG EXE supercar. When Austin Rover left rallying, they sold the cars and crucially the engine design to TWR, who improved the design, turning it into a larger three and a half liter turbocharged engine that they could use for the next generation of XJR cars. But it would also be ideal for the XJ220. The concept car had included just about every piece of 80s technology, all-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, height adjustable suspension, ABS, butterfly doors, and the adjustable rear wing, of course. Four-wheel steering wasn't necessary for a race car, as were the adjustable suspension and Nix butterfly doors that hadn't been fully developed yet and had to be propped open. The team found a way to do away with the cool but heavy automatic rear wing. The all-wheel drive system was harder to drop, but for most situations, including Group B racing, it was thought rear-wheel drive would be adequate. Even ABS was dropped after feedback from enthusiasts and racing drivers. It wasn't just weight that drove removing these parts, though. Each added complexity, which increased the development budget and time until production. As work continued, Jaguar announced that they'd been sold to Ford, ending Jaguar's short run as an independent car company. The brutal truth was Jaguar probably couldn't have continued a, as an independent manufacturer for much longer than the late 80s or into the early 90s. With the recession in the early 90s, with, without Ford behind it at that point, it, it would have been very, very difficult. Thankfully, the XJ220 project included several ex-Ford people, including project lead Mike Morton, who'd been involved in the Ford RS200 and Sierra RS500 projects, and Ford held him in very high regard. Again, quite lucky in, in that Ford really didn't get involved very much. Um, they'd just bought Jaguar. They had big problems with Jaguar, what, what, with what they'd bought in terms of the, the company and the factories and the quality and the fact that there were no new models in the pipeline. So I think Ford's senior manager were quite happy that this supercar was kind of being developed. It was bubbling away in the background. It, it was still newsworthy. And it was the only thing that was going to be new for at least two years. Nick had moved to Peugeot, but had been coaxed back to finish the car he'd helped create in his spare time. Since he left, the car had been shortened and the exterior altered to accommodate elements such as larger inlets for the turbocharged engine. This had a knock-on effect to the interior, the short wheelbase in particular made for very tight packaging. 
and the other constraint was that the, the photos had all been published and um, the deposits had been taken, £50,000 from custom, 350 customers. So the car and the interior had to look like in those photos as far as possible. And so after about three days, I had to go to uh, the project boss, Mike Morton, and say, there's no way that the interior that I designed could fit into this new interior package. One upside of the Ford purchase was access to Ford's parts bin. They weren't really considered for the mechanicals, but came in handy inside. For the interior, yeah, I did choose Ford parts. I wasn't under any pressure to. It was simply that there was kind of the feeling, well, if Ferrari used Fiat parts and it, it seems okay, it's part of that link to the parent company, then maybe for us to use Ford parts wouldn't be a bad idea. And Jaguar itself didn't have many components. It had two models, XJ, XJS and XJ40. There weren't actually many parts to choose from and they weren't particularly suitable. So the vents were from a Ford Fiesta and the interior handles were from Escorts. Some of the switches were also Ford. So it's those kind of plastic interior parts which are, are very expensive to tool up, way beyond the budget. Not everything was from Ford though. The rear lights came from the Rover 200 and the seats came from an unlikely source. The concept, we'd use XJS seats, but actually those seat frames weren't ideal at all and were very heavy. I found that the BMW Z1 seat, the Z1 had, had come out, uh, that seat had a, a seat frame which, which sat very, very low onto the floor. One feature that differentiated the car from many others was the dashboard that wrapped around the driver into the door. The doors were very, very deep. So part of it was just what can we put in there to fill up the, the depth of the door on the driver's side and give it some functional benefit. And the second reason was that kind of wraparound thing. It was a reversal of what had been the, the layout of the instruments in, in the D-Type and in XJ13 to some extent. There were extra in instruments on those cars. It was in the center of the car facing towards the driver. So it was just a, a reversal of that to put them into the doors. Soon the production date loomed. It was 18 months to, to design it for production and, and launch it by September 91 at, at Tokyo Motor Show. And then first cars would go on sale a few months after that. So it, it, there was really tight timescales every, every week, whereas the concept had a very leisurely timescale over several years. Um, uh, and the, the production car was very different. Many of the people working on the project had come from motorsports and struggled with making a production car that had to pass a minutia of road regulations, like making sure the wing mirror angle conformed with government requirements. There was also the headache of tooling up to produce 200 cars compared with less than five, especially with the refined luxury car Jaguar demanded that required real attention to detail. There was a little bit of politics involved in the from the TWR side, they didn't want to go back to Jaguar to get Keith or another designer involved with that because they were a bit afraid of that, that it, it was going to hold things up and, and stop them hitting a deadline. So if it could be resolved in-house or they could use me to do a lot of that stuff, uh, it was a lot easier um, politically. So I had a slightly tricky hat to wear because on the one hand, um, you know, I was, because I'd, I'd worked in the main Jaguar studio and ultimately the Visual parts had to be agreed and signed off with, with Jeff Lawson as the, the design director. Jeff trusted me to do stuff and I'd ask him to come down and, and look at things as and when and keep him on side. As the project near completion, both money and time became a challenge. It was self-financing because the customers put down £50,000 deposits. So there was £17.5 million pounds sitting there in the bank that was paying the wages and paying for the tooling and the development. For most of the development time, that was going to be enough. And Tom Wapishaw seemed quite happy. He realised there was a profit margin that towards the end of that two-year period, that uh, that budget was being eaten up pretty fast, as is often the way. Um, you know, things didn't necessarily go to plan. Things were delayed. Stuff had to be redesigned. Um, you know, and that, there wasn't any new money coming in. Tooling ramped up at the new factory designed to make the XG220. It would be built alongside TWR's XJR15, the car Tom Walkinshaw had been designing when he heard of the XJ220 and the reason he'd gone white in the face. The first production car was assembled for the 1991 Tokyo Motor Show where it was unveiled. The XJ220 performed high-speed testing. 
and although it did get to the coveted 220 miles an hour, it recorded 212.3 miles an hour, making it the fastest production car. The 0-60 time was a savage 3.6 seconds, and all in a car with leather-trimmed comfort and an air-conditioned cabin. Delivery started in the middle of 1992 and ramped up to one car per day. The press couldn't wait to get their hands of it, of course, and when they did, reviews were mixed. The performance was undeniable, but living with the car was another matter. The engine was unrefined at low revs, the pedals were heavy with a grinding transmission and cracking chassis. But then this was never a car with all the grace of a Ford Escort around town. This was a piece of automotive theatre, and on that level, Jaguar delivered. It was a Ferrari F40 with luxury and comfort. Of course, the original goal of the XJ220 had been to win Le Mans. Three XJ220C racing versions were entered into the 1993 race. Two retired with engine failure, but the third was victorious, beating the Porsche by two laps. But it was controversially disqualified for not running with catalytic converters. Jaguar would try again, but in subsequent years it was outpaced by cars like the new McLaren F1. To drum up interest to sell some more of the road-going versions of the cars, Jaguar released the XJ220S, something closer to the Le Mans car. Gone was the leather trim on the interior, and it featured a Kevlar seat. The front and rear used lightweight polymer bodywork, and it featured a large wing to shout its sporting credentials. Jaguar had intended to produce at least 350 cars given the flurry of deposits, but the change between concept and production, a price that ballooned, plus the late 80s, early 90s recession damped expectations. It all got messy as Jaguar told customers that if they didn't want an XJ220, they had to buy their way out of their contracts. The wealthy customers fought back, suing Jaguar, saying that the car had changed so much the contract was null and void. Jaguar won the lawsuit, showing the car's specifications were close enough to the concept. The McLaren F1, the new fastest production car in 1992, might have persuaded customers to look elsewhere as well, especially with its butterfly doors, although that car also ended up falling short on sales. Just 282 XJ220s were produced, and although production ended in 1994, it took a further three years to sell the last car. It was discounted to around a quarter of the price when production had begun. After production ended, the factory was sold to Aston Martin, and it would be used to produce the DB7. But how did the XJ220's bedfellow fare, the TWR XJR15? It sold less, only 53 road-going versions, but then that had been TWR's plan all along. Each sold for £500,000, just a little more than the XJ220. Once Jaguar exited motorsports, the XJR15 was revised as a Nissan R390. It fought for Le Mans wins, but like the XJ220, it was never successful. The XJ220 was born at a time when Jaguar had just been privatised, and the world was filled with endless possibilities that were only curtailed by its bank balance. When the XJ220 ended production, Jaguar had been bought by Ford and its focus was on modernising Jaguar's antiquated production line and creating the next generation S-Type and X-Type. It had little time for side projects, which was a shame because the XJ220 was a clever way of injecting some excitement into the Jaguar brand, leveraging deposits to fund it and a motorsports partner to help build it and at 212.3 miles an hour, it was a rare car that combined blistering speed with luxury and comfort. Again, many thanks to Nick Hull for his insight into such a fascinating car. There are links in the description to both his Ford and Land Rover books. There's also a link to the full interview on the right, which has a lot more detail on the whole XJ220 project. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.